Hello my friends and welcome again to another edition of Mental Health Storytime. My name is Lori and I work for the Children's Book Bank. Uh, right now I'm not at the Children's Book Bank. I'm on my couch where I'm going to tell you some stories and you can watch them from the comfort of your couch or chair or living room rug or wherever you've put your device. Hello. Today we're going to talk about friendship and how it's hard sometimes to make friends, the difficulties of friendship, bullying, sort of the opposite of friendship, all that kind of stuff. And we're going to explore those things with two books. One is Lila and the Crow by Gabrielle Grimard. That's a little bit more about bullying. And The Invisible Boy by Trudy Ludwig and Patrice Burton. There's that one. Yes, this one's less about bullying specifically and more just that it's hard to make friends sometimes if it's a new school you're going to or if you're just not someone who likes to make a lot of noise. Sometimes it's hard to communicate with people uh, and make friends easily. So let's do The Invisible Boy first. I think that's a good idea. All about making friends. Let's just make sure you can see the picture. Here we go. That's good. Can you see Brian, the invisible boy? Even Mrs. Carlotti has trouble noticing him in her classroom. She's too busy dealing with Nathan and Sophie. I'm gonna show you. I bet you can tell which one's Brian and Nathan and Sophie. And there's some other kids. Nathan has problems with what Mrs. Carlotti calls volume control. He uses his outside voice inside too much. Sophie whines and complains when she doesn't get her way. Nathan and Sophie take up a lot of space. Brian doesn't. Yeah, they are. There's Brian. When the bell rings for recess, Micah and JT take turns choosing kids for their kickball teams. The best players get picked first, then the best friends of the best players than the friends of the best friends. Only Brian is left, still waiting and hoping. There, you can see Brian. JT glances in Brian's direction and just as quickly looks away. We've got enough players for each team, he tells the others. Let's play ball. In the cafeteria, Madison and her friends talk about her birthday party. The rope swing over the pool was awesome, says JT. Yeah, so was the water slide, adds Fiona. That was the best pool party ever. I'm so glad you guys had fun, says Madison. Everybody did, except for Brian. He wasn't invited. At choosing time, while the other kids play board games and read, Brian sits at his table doing what he loves to do best. He draws fire-breathing dragons scaling tall buildings. There's the dragon. And the man saying, thank you for toasting my marshmallow. That's pretty funny. He draws space aliens locked in intergalactic battles, greedy pirates digging for treasure, and superheroes with the power to make friends wherever they go. On Monday morning, Mrs. Carlotti introduces Justin, a new student, to the class. Brian smiles shyly at him. Some of the other kids sneak looks at Justin, trying to figure out if he's cool enough to be their friend. They haven't quite made up their minds yet. At lunch, Madison and JT watch Justin eat with chopsticks. What's that? asks Madison as she points at Justin's food. It's bulgogi, says Justin. Bulgogi is Korean barbecued beef. My grandma made it for me. It's really good. Do you want to try some? There's no way I'd eat boogergi. That's not very nice. All the kids laugh. All of them, that is, except Brian. He sits there wondering which is worse, being laughed at or feeling invisible. 
The next day, when Justin goes to his cubby to put away his backpack, he notices a piece of paper with his name on it. Justin, I thought the bulgogi looked good. From Brian. There's Brian eating the bulgogi. At morning recess, Brian finds a piece of chalk on the ground and starts drawing away. You're Brian, right? Says Justin. Yeah. Thanks for the note. Hey, Justin, Amelia calls out from the tetherball court. You're up next. Sorry, I gotta go, says Justin. By the way, that was a really cool drawing, he adds before taking off. Back in class, Mrs. Carlotti asks the kids to team up in twos or threes for a special project. The kids scurry around the room to pair off. Brian heads toward Justin. I'm already with Justin, says Emilio. Find someone else. Brian looks at the floor, wishing he could draw a hole right there to swallow him up. Mrs. Carlotti said we can have up to three people in our group, and we're only two. Come on, Emilio, let him work with us, says Justin. Mary is saying that, and Justin says, oh, okay, I guess. Mrs. Carlotti gives the class directions for the project. Your assignment is to work together to write a story about what you see in the photograph. Use your imagination and have fun. Whoa, that's cool. What kind of people do you think would live in houses like that? I'll show you. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I don't know, but I bet Brian could draw them to go with our story, says Justin. Brian smiles as he takes out his lucky pen. working together and it looks like they're having fun. You notice something different about Brian? What'd you think about that one? It's lunchtime again. Brian's least favorite part of the day. Another 20 long minutes of kids talking and laughing with everybody else but him. Brian, he hears someone shout, Brian, over here! Brian turns and sees Justin waving him over. Emilio nods at Brian as he makes room for him at the table. Cookie? Thanks. Maybe, just maybe, Brian's not so invisible after all. And that is the very abrupt ending. I thought there was going to be more, but that is the end. Let's look at it again one more time. And he's not so invisible. And he's eating a cookie with his new friends. And that's pretty nice. That's the end of The Invisible Boy. And I'm a big fan of that one because I'm sure you hear a lot about bullying at school and that it's not okay, you know, to hurt other people's feelings. And if you're being bullied, then, you know, you should tell someone about it, that kind of stuff. But I feel like we talk less about just having trouble making friends. That no one's trying to hurt Brian's feelings on purpose. No one is being really mean to Brian, they just sort of forget about him because he's a very quiet, shy, young person. So if you're someone like Brian, that's something to take away. That you probably will make friends at some point, it just might take you a longer time. You can do something like Brian does. You could slip someone a note if you think they're cool. If that makes you more comfortable than going up to them and saying, hey, be my friend, because that's kind of hard sometimes for everybody, young and old and in between. And if you see someone, you know, like Brian in your class, if you notice that no one talks to that one kid and you don't know why, it might not be because they don't want any friends. They probably do. So, you know, if you're bold and brave and loud, unlike Brian, then, you know, you can take a step and make a friend with that person. It'll probably make them really happy. So that's the invisible boy. And the next one we're going to do is Lila and the Crow. It's a little bit more about bullying specifically, but we will talk about it at the end. Lila has just moved to a new city. Every day she goes outside, sits on the sidewalk, and scratches at the dirt with her stick. A crow calls from across the road. She traps bugs in a jar, then lets them go. 
She plays hopscotch on the empty road. But Lila wishes she had a friend. But this morning she gets up early, dresses, and leaves the house. With the wind in her hair and a smile on her face, she seems to be flying on her way to school. Her heart as light as a feather, she imagines herself surrounded by new friends. The teacher, Mr. Nicholas, introduces Lila. She sees her classmates looking at her and can't wait to get to know them. Squirming at her desk, Lila taps her foot impatiently. Finally, it's recess and the children head out to play. Now is Lila's chance to make a friend. But suddenly a voice rises above the others. Nathan, the leader of the pack, shouts, A crow! A crow! The new girl's hair is dark like a crow. The others stare at Lila. Some whisper to their friends, then turn away. Lila stands alone, holding her ball. On the way home, Lila's heart is as heavy as a stone. A crow perches on the branch of an old oak tree, its feathers as black as Lila's hair. It caws and croaks as if it wants to tell her something, but Lila just walks by. The next day, Lila wears a knitted cap to hide her hair, but as soon as Nathan sees her, he cries out, A crow! A crow! The new girl's skin is dark like a crow. The others giggle and point. Lila's heart grows as heavy as two stones. She drops her head and slowly walks away. As Lila heads home after a long, lonely day, the crow watches. Lila looks up but keeps walking. The crow spreads its wings and glides along behind her. Lila spins around. Leave me alone, she yells. She doesn't want company, not even a bird. On the third day, Lila goes to school wearing her cap and a sweater with a very, very high neck that she pulls up over her chin. Nathan peers at her for a moment. Then he shouts, a crow, a crow. The new girl's eyes are dark like a crow. A few others laugh quietly at first. Then more children join in and the laughter gets louder. Lila's heart grows as heavy as three stones. She sits at the edge of the playground until recess ends. After school, Lila kicks at everything in sight. Dead leaves, branches, and stones lying on the ground. The crow is watching her again. This time it lands on the path and hops toward her. Lila picks up a stone. As she hurls it at the bird, it flies away. Every day now, Lila hides. Under her cap, inside her sweater, behind dark glasses. She plays alone at recess and sits by herself at lunch. After school, she runs home as quickly as she can. Weeks go by. The great autumn festival will soon be here. The children chatter excitedly about the costumes they're going to wear. All except Lila, who dreams of having an invisibility cloak so she can disappear forever. It's the day before the great festival. The classroom is decorated and the children can't wait to show off their costumes. Lila feels lonelier than ever. Her heart is as heavy as a mountain of stones. Running home from school as fast as she can, Lila trips. As she crashes to the ground, her heavy heart crumbles. The crow lands near her. Between her sobs, Lila lifts her head and for the first time really looks at the bird. She's surprised to see how beautiful its black feathers are, highlighted with purple. There's softness in the eyes of the creature watching her and Lila has this strange feeling that they've known each other for a long time. She takes a deep, shaky breath and wipes away her tears. The crow comes closer to Lila and seems to whisper in her ear. Her heart lightens. She gets up and hopping on one foot and then the other follows the bird, which flutters ahead of her into the woods. The bird stops in a clearing. There, under the canopy of trees, hundreds of crows spread their great wings. They circle the girl's body as she stands in wonder. 
When at last they fly away, a shower of black feathers settles at her feet. Lila has an idea. She gathers a mountain of feathers, stuffs them in her backpack, and hurries home. When the sun rises, Lila is ready. A flock of colorful little creatures heads toward the school. Then Lila makes her entrance, entrance dark and majestic. She is magnificent. That's a really cool costume. Mm -hmm. A crow! A crow! Lila is a crow! The children exclaim. Only Nathan is speechless. The children crowd around Lila, touching her soft feathers. At that moment, her heart soars. Lila is still called Crow, but she doesn't mind. Now there's something different about Mr. Nicholas's class. And that's a nicer scene than we saw all through the book, isn't it? And that's the end of my second story. Thank you so much for listening. This one, again, is all about being different, which I bet you hear about a lot, that being different is all right, and that's true. I think what Nathan, I flipped right to the page I wanted to. Nathan has a hard time understanding, and a lot of people have a hard time understanding, not just kids, but old people and young people and everybody in between. We have a bad habit of saying that, you know, the thing that I am is good. And if you're different from me, that means you're bad. Like we're opposites. Like I'm a girl and that's good. So if you're a boy, that means you're bad. And boys and girls aren't opposites. And people with light and dark skin aren't opposites. We're all just people. So, you know, Nathan likes to point out all the different things about Lila. Because that makes him feel safe. That means, you know, if, if you have the dark hair and dark skin and dark eyes and I don't, that means I'm good and you're bad. And that's not fair. That's not true. So, you know, if that's happening to you, you have different options. Lila doesn't say anything to Nathan because she doesn't feel safe doing that. And if you don't feel safe, that's okay. But you can also turn around and say, that's not true. I, I do have dark eyes or dark skin or dark hair and that's fine. Being different is just fine. You can also try to ignore him and find people that don't feel that way, that aren't acting that way. You might have noticed that through this book, no one else actually says anything unkind to Lila. They kind of just go along with the loudest person in the room, which happens sometimes. So you can look for people that aren't going to treat you that way and just ignore that person and hope that they stop. And if they don't stop, you can always go to a grown up and say, this is not okay. And you, you know, you don't have to handle it by yourself. And the crow. I guess the other takeaway is, you know, make sure if you have that in your brain that, you know, girls are good, which means boys are bad and you're bad, that that's not true. You've got to change that mindset and you've got to think about things differently and make sure you don't say them out loud because you might regret that. Just think about it before you're going to say it. Thank you so much for listening to my two stories about bullying and friendship and all that stuff. We have Listen to The Invisible Boy by Trudy Ludwig and Patrice Barton. And Lila and the Crow by Gabrielle Grimar. That's all I have to say for today. Thank you for listening to Mental Health Storytime every Saturday on YouTube. If you want to be notified of when the next one comes out, you can follow us on Facebook at the Children's Book Bank Canada, or you can subscribe wherever you see a big red button that says subscribe. You can click on that and it will tell you that we've posted new videos. But until then, I'm going to say goodbye and have a good day.